Okay, Rosewall. Michigan, two-point favorites as of this recording, Wednesday mm-hmm. at 12.45 on the East Coast, against number four, Alabama. This game, Monday, New Year's Day, 5 o'clock Eastern. Marler will already have gone through, what, like six things of deodorant, a couple – Deodorant, fireball, all the above. It'll just be a just a panic attack in a, in, a, in a bottle. I can't wait. We are a year removed from Nick Saban arguing that his team deserved a playoff spot as a two-loss team with nothing better than victories against eight and four teams, all because he said Bama would have been favored against three teams in the field. Now, Bama enters as a rare that, underdog. By the way, that PR person has has no, is no longer with the university, just to be very clear. The Saban person who was in it. charge of that was one of the dumbest ideas I have ever seen. Hey, man, why don't you go on Fox, the 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 one channel that doesn't cover Alabama games and arguably doesn't like the SEC, and go argue your point. And somebody was like, "That's a good idea. Go do it." Joe Klatt, uh, that was on. Uh, that was up with Joe Klatt six months later too. That's that Saban actually doubled down real. on that and still continue to say that on Fox Airways. Yeah. Um, but Bama as an underdog. It's very rare. You you probably know all the numbers that I'm about to, to throw out mm-hmm. here. Since the start of 2009, this is just the yeah. sixth time that Alabama has been an underdog. 2009 SEC Championship against Florida. 2015 game at Georgia. 2021 SEC Championship against Georgia. 2021 National Championship against Georgia. 2023 SEC Championship against Georgia. And now the Rose Bowl against Michigan. Bama has won outright as an underdog, four of those five instances in the last 15 years in which they have been an underdog. Knowing that, is there a little boost for Bama money line? Would you take the plus two for Bama just to be safe? Or are you, Chris Marler, the biggest Bama fan I have ever met in my entire life, are you laying the two for Michigan and emotionally hedging? So here's the thing, Connor. I've been emotionally hedging. You've accused me of this for five years. And I <laughs> genuinely, in my heart of hearts, do not feel like I've done it. The, the Clemson thing, that started with Clemson in 2018. When I went out there, and I was like, I think Bama loses this game because I don't think that their offensive line is going to be able to hang with the Clemson's D-line. You're right. That wasn't the only reason they lost that game. But I will say now, this season, I have fully leaned into emotionally hedging. And it has worked out. It has worked wonders. Picked him to lose against Ole Miss. I, yep. The Texas thing I said since the summer, I just I and I gave out all the reasons why. I said, don't be surprised if they're down thirteen to three in the first quarter. They were down fourteen to three. I said, don't be surprised if they're they're losing at halftime. They come back a little bit in the second half, but they're going to lose by ten. All those things happened, but I picked them to lose to Ole Miss. I think I picked them to lose to Tennessee. I think I picked them to lose to LSU. Definitely picked them to lose to Georgia. Um, you so know, you thought and, they were going seven and five this year, essentially. I, just, I was I was after the USF game. My level of confidence in this team was absolutely shattered. Um, it has been one of the most fun seasons as a Bama fan. And listen, if you're a Michigan fan, I'll apologize in advance because I, I'm, I'm, I am going to dote a little bit on this team. This has been one of the most fun years I've ever had as being a fan of a team and, and, and being able to cover it for like a job. You know, I think maybe the objectivity is skewed against Bama for me more than anything because it, it's it's been such an uphill battle. We've never seen this before. It's a, It's not like 2014. It's not like 2015. This is the earliest they've ever lost in a season at Alabama. I think the closest comp you could say is 2015 because you lost that game in September to Ole Miss at home, um, you know, and they were down by a lot in, in, in a lot of that game. Um, and then you had to kind of climb back out there. You had a lot of questions at quarterback. You started a guy in game one that was different than, than or sorry, in, in the game you lost than, um, than like the following week. I, I have had so much fun watching this team grow. And I think what's really odd about this is, so many people last year had this idea of Saban being washed because it's too old. And it's a young man's game with how the calendar works in college football. And I think there's a lot of merit to that in terms of it's difficult if you're in your 70s to to be doing all these things and have to constantly be in the portal and, and re-recruiting your team and then recruiting other kids, all that kind of stuff. But what's what I've talked to Jim Dunaway, a good friend of your show and ours, and, and, and one of the things he said I thought was very interesting was what's rejuvenated Saban more than anything is he's had to start coaching again, like really, really coaching this team and, and coaching these guys up and, and, and Jalen Miller on the defense and all those things. And it's just been really fun to watch them get better seemingly every week. And they've had some scares, but it's been a really, really good, good season. Um, I don't want to give away my pick yet. Let's save it. But Let's save it. I, yeah, go ahead. 
so if you, you can hear all those things and you could say, mm-hmm. is, is this team maybe a little bit cut from the same cloth as 2014 Ohio State? Tina you know, loses early mm-hmm. on in the season, a quarterback change. Uh, I mean, call it a change if you want at Bama. Jalen Milrow has turned into a different quarterback than the guy that we saw yeah. early in the season. So I guess it's it's different in that way. But this team that just looks like, man, they lose early in the season and they just they lose a non-conference play and then they just figure it out. And right. there are probably a lot of people approaching this saying, I'm just going to blindly bet Bama and I'm going to take them at every turn in the playoff. And maybe maybe there are plenty of SEC fans that are that are approaching it that way and just saying, you know what? I think there are. I, I'm just going to blindly t- – whatever whatever is on the table for them, I am now buying into the notion that if you pick against Bama, like what happened in 2009, like what happened in 2012, like what happened in 2015, when Bama wasn't the pick to win the SEC in those seasons, and yeah. what do they do? They won the SEC. They won a national championship. This could be another one of those years. They've already won the SEC. Will they win a national championship? So much of that, and if you are – just blindly betting Bama, you're probably also putting a lot of faith in Jalen Milrow. Can we talk mm-hmm. about some of these these Jalen Milrow props um, as it yes. relates to these to this game? I think it's interesting. I know the Michigan defense has been rock solid. Mm-hmm. I also know the list of opposing quarterbacks that Michigan has faced is not rock solid. As my guy yeah. Will would say, basura, basura. <laughs> Trash. Easily. The best quarterback that Michigan has faced this year is Talia Tungabailoa. Yep. Really nice player. All-time leading passer in Big Ten history. Still wild. Yeah. But if that's easily the best quarterback that your team has faced, that's telling. That's really telling. And if you're saying, oh, what about C.J. Stroud? I wouldn't necessarily count last season towards this season. Last season? No. Michigan defense. Also, if you're trying to make a comp and say like, oh, well, you know, they stopped C.J. Stroud, so that means they're going to stop Jalen Milrow. Very different players. I think Jalen Very Milrow. C.J. Stroud had, like, one game of positive rushing yards going into the, the game against uh, Georgia last year. Yeah, different player. I, I think Jalen Milrow has more similarities to Max Duggan than he does C.J. Yeah. Stroud. If you're talking about what they like to do, how they like to be able to move the chains, that's probably a better comp. Michigan has faced two top 50 passing offenses. One was led by Salia Tungabaloa. The other was led by Kyle McCord who is now in the transfer portal. Well, actually, he's at Syracuse. So yeah. that's that's telling. And by the way, both of those teams threw for 240 yards. And I know that Bama doesn't have a top 50 passing offense. So if you're like, oh, well, Bama's, you know, the, Bama's not particularly good throwing the ball either. I, I would push back on that. If mm-hmm. you're doubting the passing abilities, since November, Jalen Milrow, one turnover, one interception on 118 passing attempts. 19 passing plays of 20 yards, 10.2 yards per attempt, 67% passing since the calendar turned to November, which J.J. McCarthy on the other side, since he had the calendar turned to November. Oh, I love this. This is a fun one, game. One touchdown pass, one game with 150 passing yards. Like Milrow, also exactly 118 passing attempts since then, seven yards per attempt, 11 passing plays of 20 yards, only two passing plays of 30 yards. Jalen Milrow props, though, are probably going to be the play if you're just saying Bama's going to win this football game. Yeah. What's what stands out to you with him as it relates to that? Well, one, I just want to go back to one thing you said about JJ McCarthy real quick because I I I, I brought this up a couple weeks ago. His first seven games when he was a Heisman contender, maybe a front runner in some people's eyes, he had 17 total touchdowns, and he was averaging 240 yards per game, and then. You can even include the game where he had the four touchdowns against Michigan State because, you know, Michigan State's a really good team. Um, he's had one touchdown in his last five games. There's a, there's a, there's two reasons you could point at, and maybe it's a good combination of both. But you had one very, very famous assistant coach that was on the sidelines for and, and other people's sidelines for the first seven games. Who spells his first name correctly with two N's and an O. We must point that we out. we love. Yep. Um, but since Connor Stiggins has left – and Michigan has had to actually play somebody with a pulse. Let's not forget, this is the second year in a row where they go into the game against Ohio State with a with a strength of schedule outside the top 50, yet a, a concrete solid ranking in the top three, right? Like this is a team that didn't play anybody the entire season until the month of November, and it just so happens like they finally start facing top 40 defenses, which they had to do against Penn State, Iowa, Maryland, shockingly enough, and Ohio State. 
and all of a sudden the numbers fall off the map, right? You get if I, Michigan fans have given me every reason why that's happened, and and every excuse in the book of why it's happened. I don't care what the reason is. If it's not Connor Stallions, if it's just because you play tougher schedules and tougher comp- competition, that's fine too. Because what you're walking into in Pasadena is going to be a really, really good defensive unit. Now, going back to the actual question you asked, Jalen Milrow, he has been phenomenal. Like you just said, the month of November, only one interception. Like people, people look at him, and I think they still have this idea that he's he's not a great quarterback. A lot of people, like Michigan fans, I think I've seen a couple of videos um, that have come out about how how he's like he's just kind of like a probably the worst quarterback in this entire playoff, right? Um, if you're sleeping on Jalen Milrow, or if you're dancing on that grave, I've said it before about Bama, you better dance lightly because that guy is the moment he steps on the field. I don't care who's on the other sideline. The moment he steps on the field, he's the best athlete on the field on either sideline. And I think that he is going to have to have a big game. The thing where I would, the prop bet that comes out the most, and this is not going to like, Batman's aren't going to like this. It's Jalen Milrow interceptions. And I hate to be that negative dude that just said the same thing with Penix, but also I'm going to say it here with Milrow. He's only turned the ball over once since, since November started, right? You look at Michigan as a defense. These numbers they have, number one scoring margin, number one scoring defense, number one in passing touchdowns allowed. They've only allowed seven total passing touchdowns all year. You look at how many interceptions they've had, they've had 16. Like, I mean, being plus nine, pass T to INT ratio is crazy. I don't think it's far-fetched to say that Milrow might have an interception, and here's why. It's because you talk about trying to get things going against a very solid unit trying to get the run game. I, I could see some frustration from Milrow if they're not able to connect on a couple of big plays, if they're not able to move the chains effectively in the first half. Maybe he gets frustrated and throws one. He's had slow starts, though. It was mm-hmm. a slow start against Georgia. Very I, slow I was, start. I, I was like, all right. The, the couple times it looks like he might have had an open receiver early in that game. He was just kind of off. I think Georgia's coverage was really good early on in that really game. Good. And, yeah, you look at the final line, you see 13 for 23, and you're like, okay, that doesn't really impress you. Move the needle. Go ask Georgia how tough it was to stop that guy when the game was on the line. There's a reason why yeah. Bama led for the final, what, 43 minutes of that game? And when Georgia mm-hmm. had to have a stop in those final couple minutes, Jalen Milrow just like, oh, nope, I'm going to hit it with my legs, and I'm going to make sure that we move the chains. I'm going to make sure you don't get the ball back. I'm going to make sure the yeah. two-time defending national champs that have won 29 consecutive games do not have a chance to get that type of confidence for a yeah. last minute drive. And that's what that kid did. And he he mm-hmm. has been so much better than he was early in the season when he was throwing interceptions against air. I mean, yeah, some of those predetermined reads that that you're just like, oh, so does do teams just have to put zone coverage on you and, and you're just gonna collapse? And the guy that he has become has been so different because I mean, he's seen no shortage of zone coverage since then. You know you can't just play mat, man coverage and turn your back on Jalen Milrow. They're going to drop nine. Shout out Auburn. Mm-hmm. You're going to do what you can. Um, I think that there is probably <laughs> – It took you a second to catch on that By one. the way, Connor, real quick on that. People don't give this enough credit. I think Bama fans do, but other people don't. That's a design play, and he read it perfectly – and then put the ball in a spot where only his guy could get it. And I think that that's something from even that play. People are like, he's a very good downfield thrower. Some would argue that DJ James should have also had a chance to be able to get it as Auburn's top corner. He just took one Do long step, though. Yeah. yeah exactly. Maybe watch the ball next time instead of the man. Probably. Probably. But if you're betting Michigan in this game and you're saying, I just like Michigan, this is their, their year, Michigan against the world, this is how I want to look mm-hmm. at this. I don't think Bama is quite as good as what this win streak down the stretch has suggested. You're probably taking the over on Jalen Milrow turnovers, and you're probably mm-hmm. saying that Michigan wins an ugly game, an ugly, mm-hmm. low-scoring type game. The over-under for this game is 44 and a half. Here's something interesting that I, I, I think needs to be kept in mind as it relates to playoff games. We've had 27 playoff games so far. At least 50 total points have been scored in 18 of those 27 playoff games. Nine instances in which we haven't seen a total of 50 points. Bama has been involved in six of those nine games. Yikes. If there's... Uh, the Vegas, Vegas is daring you to try and take it over in this one. They're also daring you to take Bama. Uh, they are. They really they are. They are. Uh, I think I think taking the under is 
as as unsexy as it is, especially when you're like, man, it's, it's five o'clock Rose Bowl. I, I, maybe I don't have a rooting interest in this game because maybe you hate both of these teams. I, I don't <laughs> know, maybe that is what talks you into taking the under. Yeah. You're just like, I want to see both of these teams frustrated and unhappy. I want to see Harbaugh throwing his clipboard on the sideline. I want to see yeah. Saban pulling out his hair. Maybe I'm just going to bet the under and that's my only play. Would you advise against that? Uh, yes and no, because I, I, I think that, that that doing that, you look at what Michigan has done, especially, and, and how good that defense has been, but you're, you're kind of discounting and discrediting how good the offenses are for, for both and how efficient they are, at least. I'm like a, a, like a, a points-per-play type situation, and, and even a points-per-play margin. I think Tennessee, or that's Wild Tennessee. Michigan was like plus 13 in, in that against their opponents this year. I mean, one of the things about Michigan that, that you know, I, I think that people hate to admit, and, and I fully understand what I said about those last four games of the season, but one of the reasons why it, like the, the margins of victory were so crazy and, and how that strength of schedule looks so bad is because of how dominant they were in those games, like, or, like for the first seven weeks of the season. Like, they, like there was nobody that came close to them. Like, they, they, are, they are a very, very solid and fundamentally sound uh, – Team, like, like, listen. I think that they have both teams have enough offensive power, firepower to take the to take the over. I don't think that it's crazy to sit here and say, like, if you, if you want to get crazy and get a teaser going, and I talk about the ten point teasers all the time, people might not want to hear it, but like Washington plus fourteen and a half, the the over of Bama Michigan at thirty four, and then and then Bama plus twelve, love that, love thirty four, um, over of thirty four, because the over is forty four. So if you're getting ten points. You could oh get it down ten points. Yeah, so you know, uh-huh. I, like it's there's other ways that you could allocate that if if you want to do a teaser. I I don't think it's crazy to bet the under here, but I really think that like like you said, anytime Vegas gives you something that you just think is a gift, okay, and betters know this everywhere. Like good betters know this everywhere. But if you're just kind of getting into it, and you're like, oh, this is so obvious. This feels like free money. It's not. It's that never hurts. free money. So I, I think that Vegas is really trying to, I don't want to say bait because that sounds bad, but they are really trying to entice that casual better to, to taking Bama and taking the uh, the under. If Michigan wins this game, I don't think it will follow a script in which J.J. McCarthy hands the football off 32 consecutive times. I just right. don't. I, no. History, recent, distant, whatever you want to call it, has told us that that's not the way that you beat Alabama by just sitting there and handing the football off. Quinn Ewers reminded us that it helps to have a quarterback with some big time, you know what's. David McCarthy mm-hmm. probably got some big time, you know what's. If you do, you got to attack downfield. You got to mm-hmm. find a way to hit on those shots. When you get that one on one matchup over the top, I don't want to say that they're going to sit there and try and attack this Alabama secondary that's been really freaking good this year. Yeah. I don't think they're necessarily going to want to do that because I don't think that they have those advantages on the outside. But if you are going to beat Alabama, I would assume that we're going to see multiple J.J. McCarthy touchdown passes. I would think, or at least an over on on maybe his passing yards or something like that, that if you're you're on the Michigan side of this and you want to parlay it into, you know, I'm I'm, I'm taking – now, maybe I'm taking Michigan money line or something like that. To right, right. So like even the, the two scares me or whatever. Um, that that would be a move that I, I think the the pro Michigan crowd would probably favor as opposed to like, oh, I think Blake Quorum is going to go off for 170 rushing yards in this game. I think more right. likely if Michigan were to win would be they're doing some things in the passing game and they're scheming at a, a really, really high level. Um, is there, you said you thought that Bama could end up being the favorite in this one by the mm-hmm. time that it kicks off, how much line movement do you anticipate? And do you think that Vegas has set the line at this hoping to get some of that last minute action yeah. from, from Bama? From a thousand Bama percent. A thousand, see people, people, and this is what Saban, you could say, didn't understand with his argument about being favored. Vegas isn't telling you they think that this team is that much better. What Vegas is trying to do right. when they set a line is get... Fifty percent of bets on both sides, so you, they are not going to lose their ass in in like a, a, a game. I, I think that it, it feels like Vegas is 
begging people to take Bama. And I'm shocked that the line is still – the line's crept up. I think it started at one and a half, and it got up to two and a half at one point. I think it's, it's hovering around two right now. There's still five days well, well, from the day we're recording this until, like, the actual game day of when it, when it goes off. I – I think Bama will be favored because I think there's going to be enough public money that comes in on Alabama because of the name. And and I know that Michigan is a is a blue blood and a brand name and all that kind of stuff. I just think that Bama people are going to take that. They 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 are more fun to watch. They have better offense. You have Nick Saban on the sideline. A lot of reasons why I think that would happen. I think that when you look at some of these props, Connor, some of the stuff that I like, um, I would stay away from the team to score first. I think one that's a really good possibility. The first score method being a field goal instead of a touchdown at plus 180, I think there's a lot of good value there. Um, like I said, this this team has kept – both these teams really have kept others out of the end zone a lot. And in and, and Michigan, especially in the first quarter and first half of games this year, um, you know, I, I think you brought up something earlier about J.J. McCarthy. And, and I think that that is – outside of the Auburn game, there has not been an example where it's like, oh, man, if you want, if you want room to run, you can gash this Alabama team. Auburn did some things that I don't think Michigan's offense is, is capable of doing. I will say that I think that one thing, regardless of, of, of who's there as the assistants, right? One thing I think Jim Harbaugh is guilty of is being very, very stubborn. And you saw this in the 2019 game. We, we were talking about this on the old pod. 2019 Bama, Michigan, Citrus Bowl. I was there. You kept fun. saying, is Don Brown going to run out there with a single high safety against those receivers? And I was like, I guarantee you he will. You first said the play. same thing. We, first play. First play. <laughs> Gary Jude, it was like, what are you doing? I do think there's a little bit of that stubborn arrogance from Jim Harbaugh. Of like, we're going to do this my way. We're going to win the way I know how to win and the way we've won because they've done that, right? You beat a top 10 Penn State team with a top 10 defense, top five defense in a lot of ways by just running the football. Do not be surprised. There's no props for this, but do not be surprised. At any point in this game, especially maybe in the second half, if you see Blake Corum throw a touchdown pass or throw a pass in general or a flea flick or something like that, because this is a this is a run first offense and everyone knows that. I don't see a lot of success on the outside against Terry and Arnold and Kool-Aid McKinstry. I yeah. see hardly any of that. Caleb Downs is a true freshman uh, safety who's been one of the best players, I think, at that position in the country, regardless of age. But there are places where you can get this Alabama team vulnerable, at least. And I think that the, the longer you see that team kind of creep up in the box, Malachi Moore coming down in the box, Caleb Downs coming in, their leading tackler, I think you might have some opportunities where maybe you can slip somebody free behind the defense with a, with a trick play. Is there potential to feel like Michigan could come out and look like the better team and there could be some confirmation bias of, oh, yeah, you know what? This, this is just Michigan's year and, yeah. and, and go, well, maybe I like first half money line for Michigan for Michigan to go into the halftime with a lead uh -huh. and then get the action on the Bama side, a Bama team that has trailed at halftime, I believe five times this year has trailed at halftime more than any Saban coached team. I believe yeah. in the last, well, like even including 2007, I want to say they have trailed mm -hmm. more times at half and they have gotten to this point. Bama, Money line, if they're trailing at halftime, would be an interesting couple of bets to try and – I mean, that's one live bet and one, I guess, not live bet if you're taking Michigan money line in the first half. But that Dude. could be something where there could be some some real interest and some upside. And and from a value standpoint, I think there's a lot of value there. Michigan has been the best team in the country in the first half. From from offense and defense standpoint, the, the scoring margin – you already heard me say that the scoring margin full game is 27.2. They also lead for first half as well. Um, I mean, they have just been red zone TD allowed. They're ranked number one. First half scoring D, they're allowing five total points per game. Now, here's here's what I do think is interesting here, Connor, is, is what you brought up. Michigan first half money line is minus 125, right? Mm -hmm. That's not, not, not crazy. crazy. If you want to take a flyer on something, we've talked about this on some of the other episodes that I think is a really, really good potential play, and that is with a team that has made second half adjustments so much at Alabama – and into so much success. LSU, you're tied. You win by 14. Tennessee, you're down by 13. You win by 14. Ole Miss, you're down by one. You win by 14. There's a lot to be said for that, especially with the fact that how good Michigan is out of the gates. Um, Michigan to win the first half, Alabama to win the full game, plus 700. Love the value. Oh, that's Love it. the value on that. Wow. That, I didn't think it'd be that significant, but mm -hmm. that is uh... – 
that that's that's really really juicy. And for those, I think it was Taylor Lewan. If you've watched some of his rants about Bama, wherein he said that Michigan like has has allowed like a touchdown in the third quarter. If you would want to buck that trend, he was wrong about that stat. He was definitely yeah. wrong about that stat. So don't take yeah. that one to the bank. Take this to the bank. Well, instead. and if also if Taylor Lewan's watching, which I'm sure he is. One of the things I love to do when I research a team is instead of just focusing on the one game to fit my narrative, like South Florida for Alabama, maybe you watch any of the other 12 games. I respect his unbiased opinion. Yeah, totally. Yeah, same. Very much. I respect your unbiased opinion, Marler. Uh, I think you approach this like, a, like someone with money at stake, not someone with so much unbelievable emotional investment into this. Listen, team. we beat Georgia and we're in here and I don't care how that sounds. Like I... I didn't expect them to make the playoff. They probably still shouldn't have made the playoff. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. I think it could end well. I will give you my prediction when you ask for it. Marler playing with house money is a dangerous thing. All right, give it to us. Prediction. Bama 24 to 20. I, I, I think that this is a really, really good game, I think, for, for a majority of it. I don't think this is going to be a comfortable game. I think it's going to play out a lot like the, the Bama LSU games in the early 2010s. Just two very good defenses, trying to see who flinches first. Um I, I I just I love this Alabama team, and I, and I, anytime you tell me you get SEC players to go up against the Big Ten opponents, you know there I'm going to go with the SEC. I was waiting um, for it. That's I mean you know like I, I just I feel listen this Bama team is they have played enough competition, they've played enough close games, they've played enough good teams, and not and not really flinched since the Texas game. I just I love where this team's at. And, and I think that this is a really, really good spot for them going up against a team that is, I think, a little bit overconfident. I think a little bit overconfident. I didn't have a set prediction coming into this that I was all over. But I'm just going to piggyback. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to copy and paste. Copy and paste. In solidarity. 24-20, Bama wins this one. Love it. That would be the under. Just barely hitting. Depending on barely. what that finishes at. But it, it's currently at 44 and a half. So that would be the under mm-hmm. barely hitting. That would be... Obviously, Bama um, winning outright, not just covering. But, um, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I think hopefully we're going to get two great semifinal games like last year. Last year was awesome. It was yeah. such a fantastic day of football. And one of my favorite memories of doing this job is standing there on that sideline of the Peach Bowl, waiting for that game to start and talking with our guy, Josh Pate, and awkwardly standing about 20 feet behind Urban Meyer and watching him ride the, the ebbs and flows rooting yeah. against Michigan, not rooting for TCU, but just rooting against Michigan yeah. um, and how fun of a day of college football that, that turned out to be um, even for you. Cause you got to watch Bama beat Kansas state in a bowl game that everybody and I got to go to the beach bowl and you were, and you were at the peach bowl. So it was a great yeah. day of college football for outside all. of the Uber three hour. I don't think I got into an Uber until three 30 in the morning. Cause it was new year's Eve, but yeah, outside of that, it was awesome. Who calls for an Uber at 12.30 on New Year's Eve in a major city? The entire city did. The entire city did. That's your answer. God, I feel like that one's on you. (laughs) Hey, sports fans. We've got an exciting offer exclusively for new users of ESPN Bet. When you join, be sure to enter the promo code SOUTH during sign up to unlock an additional $50 in your betting account. That's right. You can wager on your favorite sports and receive up to $250 in bonus bets when you use the promo code SOUTH. Please remember, you must be 21 years old to participate in sports betting. We encourage responsible gambling within your means. If you ever need assistance or support, please reach out to 1-800-522-4700. Join the action today and make the most of this fantastic offer.